Amen. Good morning and welcome to everybody. It's good to have you here with us today on this first Sunday of October. Uh, the gentleman on the piano this morning is our good friend Steve Bass. We've known the Basses for over 20 years now. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Been a while. It's been a good time. It's been 25, I think. Yeah, Steve's going to be playing some today. There's a reason we should be playing some. He'll be playing and singing. If you look in your bullets and there's no hymns listed, but they'll let us know what we're going to join in with them and have a good time singing. So it is a blessing to have each of you here. Those who will be joining us virtually as well, if anybody zooms in. My sister's been trying to zoom in, but she has the old link. We're sending out the new one every week, but uh, the old one doesn't work anymore. So uh, we're glad whoever is here is here. Let's pray together as we begin this time. Heavenly Father, for the blessing of this day, for the occasion of your people gathering in worship, for the opening of our hearts to receive your truth, to be anointed by your Holy Spirit, to experience the fellowship of believers in the communion of saints. Let your people be blessed in worship today. Let our hearts be open. But above all, we ask, let the name of Jesus Christ be lifted up and magnified among all people. And Lord Jesus, we ask this blessing upon each one in your name. Amen. Well, again, good morning and welcome. Our first hymn today. It's page three, and we'll do verse one, two, and four. Page number three, verses one, two, and four. I will invite you to stand with us as we sing. Let's sing together. Page, page three.
Again, good morning and welcome. You may be seated. In your, in your bulletin, you'll see a sheet like this. If you'd be kind enough to fill this out and drop it in the offering plate when it's passed a little later in the service, we would appreciate it. First of all, because it gives us a record of your attendance. Secondly, because on the back, please let us know how we can pray for you, how we can minister to you. I love this time of year particularly because, as I always say, our congregation is very mobile. How many of you were here last week, just as an example? Four, okay? How many of you plan on being here next week? Six, okay. We're in and out. God brings new people each Sunday. We send some back home, all of that. Prayer is one of those ways we keep in contact with each other, how we lift each other up. So please let us know how we can be praying for you and your family. We would, we would welcome that. In your bulletin, there are a couple of announcements uh, I'd like to share with you. This is going to be particularly important right here to the Healing Family because next Sunday is the last Sunday this month we will have parking. That does include Saturday. We will have parking. On Monday the 11th, that gets shut down for the rest of the month. We will still have access to the building, but we will not have parking and for your information, um, not next Sunday, we'll be live, but the two Sundays after that, we're going to be going virtual only. I'll put that in the bulletin big time next week. It'll be going out in the newsletters. We'll only be doing the recorded messages on the website, so you can log in, click on it at your convenience. And as many of our friends around the country tell me, Tim, we like this virtual worship stuff. I said, why is that? I said, well, if you get long-winded, we polish you. <laughs> We go get another cup of coffee. We walk around the house, whatever. We get around it. We'll push the button again and finish it up. So um, it's, it becomes very convenient. That'll be on the website for those two Sundays, and then we'll be back live on Halloween. But uh, the construction continues next Sunday. We do have parking, and that shuts down. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So I would commend all of those to you, and thank you for sharing the peace of Christ with each other and being here with us today. Again, I'm going to delay the scripture reading at this point because it's going to fit into the sermon three different places this today. But um, just to catch everybody up to speed a little bit, last week we talked about what a mess. We looked at the first three chapters of the book of Romans and we see how sin has infiltrated mankind and we all fall short. I'll give you a little synopsis when we start the sermon, go into that. This morning we're talking about not what a mess, but about what a God that delivers us from that mess. And I'm really looking forward to our time in the scriptures this morning. Before we get there, though, we are going to sing again in our next song. Well, actually, we're going to sing. We've never really, we haven't sung together in a long time. I'm going to attempt to sing. How many of you know the chorus, Better is One Day in Your Courts? Better, the words, we would love to join, have you join in. Hang on a second. It's kind of an old chorus that Chris Tomlin. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousand elsewhere. So anytime you hear that, please sing with us. Okay? Better is one day in your courts, and I'll help you as much as I can. Let's go ahead and say it together.
see the Lord's Prayer printed for you, and we'll close by saying the Lord's Prayer together. And Heavenly Father, your people, we come, we approach the throne of grace. We thank you for that truth. We may not know the song real well, but we do know that better is one day in your presence than a thousand away from you. And Lord God, let the hearts of your people draw close this day. Let us open ourselves to you to receive your truth, your anointing, and your blessings. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. And let this time of celebration be one that fills the souls of your people with encouragement and support. Father, we thank you. And even as we celebrate, we do remain mindful. So many people that are hurting, who we're praying for. I think of my friend Brian, his family at this time of loss of their mom this week. And we pray for the foster family. We pray your healing touch on them. We continue to pray for my sister, Lane, as she's recovering from a stroke. Lord, so many recovering from illnesses and injuries. We pray for those who have been infected with this virus, as well as other illnesses and disease. And we pray that you would bring healing to the masses, to our country, to our world. We pray for an emotional healing as well. Difficult times bring despair, grief, loss, depression even. And Lord, your word gives us such great encouragement that you bind up the heart, the broken hearts. And you give peace in place of chaos. Let that be so. Let us experience that here today as well. And Lord, we continue to pray for a spiritual healing in the lives of your people, in the lives of our country, in the lives of our world. That your people who are called by your name, that we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways and come to you for healing, for prosperity, for your blessings and
so much for leading us in worship this morning. It's always great to uh, hear you sing and play and be together. As I said, we've known Steve Bass now for over 20 years, and I don't have enough time to tell you a couple of stories, so I'll make it short and sweet. The first time I met Steve, he came to one of our church services. We were just starting a new church in the Ken Carroll area. Sat right there on the front row, folded his arms like this and crossed his legs and dared me to look at him <laughs> through the whole sermon, just like this. Second week, he uncrossed his arms and his legs. By the third week, I think we mentioned something about playing golf, and he said, you know, I, I can play the piano if you ever need any help. And we've been in ministry together with families now for over 20 years. It was a wonderful time, and one of my best friends in the world, Steve, thank you. Um, this morning, we are talking about God's Word, and what a God. Last week, we focused on what a mess. And for those of you who were here, we talked about the first three chapters of the book of Romans. These are not favorite chapters. This is not what you want to read to enlighten yourself, to lift yourself up. It's, it's much different. We see that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We see that what may be known about God has been revealed from the creation so that man is without excuse. We look at this and we see there's something that God has planted in us internally that we can view and see who he is. And yet mankind, and that includes all of us in our darkness, have chosen not to. And there's four specific ways we have an option at this point. And actually, I learned of a fifth one this week. So we're going to go over the four from last week, and then we'll pass to the new one this morning. The first one we can say, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to live life to the fullest, do exactly what I want to do. And in Max Lucado's book, The Grip of Grace, he refers to those as the hut builders. Those who build lives based on what they can experience in this world. We might call it a mansion. It may even be made out of mud. We do what we call the best we can. We indulge our pleasures, our senses. That's what we're here for. Have a good time. It's going to end one of these days, so just enjoy it right now. Now, sometimes we all kind of fall in that trap from time to time. That's no way to live continuously, though. It doesn't bring any long-term fulfillment. It's a moment, it's fleeting, and it's gone. The second one brings in another level of hypocrisy. That is called the legalist, the uh, watchdog, as, he, as Max refers to it. This is the one who likes to look at people so they can tell God exactly how bad everyone else is. That way I can compare myself and I'm a little bit better, so I must be okay. Another one of good, my good friends sitting right back here, Scott Green, uh, Mr. G or Scotty, whatever we prefer to call him, depending on how he's doing at the moment. But as an example, I'm just going to watch Scott and watch him sin this whole week. And I'm going to take out my notebook and I'm going to make notes. And I may need two notebooks for Scott. He may need three for me. What happens is we come into a level of comparison. You're not very good. I'm not very good. But if I can be better than you, that's okay in God's sight. No, that is not the plan. And we have people today who go with their life just trying to be better than someone else. God did not design us that way. And we miss the glory of God at that point. The third way we can look at it is to say, I have sinned. I must earn everything I get. I will earn my way back to God. That's the rock stacker. That's the person who has salvation by works. That's why we come to church, isn't it? To get brownie points with God. That's why we pray more brownie points. We do all this. We're stacking these rocks. We're trying to build a pavilion that will lead us to the Lord. The problem is we never get there. We can never be good enough. We can't do enough. And again, we fall short of the glory of God. The fourth one, and in Max's story, was the story of the son who said, I can't do it. And he allowed Big Brother to take him back to the Father, accepting God's grace. There's one other that I need to share with you. That's the person who just says, none of it matters, and I don't believe anything anyway. Two times this particular week in talking with various people, I have been told, 
What I believe and what you believe doesn't matter. I don't think there is a God. I will do the best I can in my own sight. I think that's a combination of all the other three right there. All of those fall short. And in our world, we have, unfortunately, we have minimized sinfulness. We're going to start with one chat passage here in chapter 3 to finalize talking about where we really stand as a people. This is not one that's going to uplift you either. Let's just get through it. It talks about the heinousness of sin. And this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that the Jews and the Gentiles alike are all under sin. Everyone has fallen short. That includes all of us. There is no one who's righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands and no one who seeks after God, not even one. All have turned away and they've all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And all of these quotes are coming from the book of Psalms and the book of Isaiah. This is not just new history. This is ancient history uh, coming into life for us as well. Their throats are like open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of viper drips from their lips and their mouth are full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their way. And the way of the peace, they do not know it. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, doesn't everybody feel glad and happy that you came to church this morning? <laughs> this is the state of mankind. We need to understand sin is a terrible part of life. We've all sinned and fallen. Okay, I've sinned. You just, well, we minimize it so easily. But sin really produces death. That's why God hates it so much. God hates sin but loves all of us who have sinned because we are valuable to him. But sin brings death. Sin separates us from God. And that's why God is so angry at sin, why he is so vehement, opposed to it. I used an example in Beaver Creek this morning. Uh, I love red roses white roses, and if anybody's from Texas, I even love the yellow rose of Texas. I think it's quite beautiful. But there's a strange thing that happens. If you cut the rose off the bush, it will die. It may stay beautiful for a day. It may even stay beautiful for a week. Maybe you can keep it in the refrigerator and get two weeks out of it, but the petals will begin to dull. They will begin to fall. It will lose its color, and it will cease to exist. That snipping the rose from the bush is exactly what sin does for us. It separates us from our source of life, who is God himself. We may look good for a week. We may look good for a year. I think we as humans have even perfected a way to look good for 60, 70, 80 years. The problem is there's still no source of life. We're still separated. And because of that, God desires to fix that. We can't indulge enough to do it. We can't judge enough to put life back in. We can't work hard enough to bring life. We can't deny it enough. But it didn't really happen to you. Well, yeah, it did. We find ourselves in a hopeless situation. We need a miracle. We need something that goes beyond our levels of comprehension to the realm of the eternal that cannot even come from ourselves. And that's why we get to look at the topic today. What a God. We see what God has done. And he is the one who gives life back. We read this in his third chapter as well. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe, and there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus our Lord. God used him, presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood 
He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left sins committed before him unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. We need a miracle. I think we misplay that word a lot. Bill, I thought of you this morning. I thought y'all were gone, but it's good to see you this morning because we all saw that miracle last night. Stanford should not have beaten Oregon. <laughs> they really shouldn't. It was a miracle they scored that touchdown. No, they played better than the other team at that moment. That's what it took. So we, we saw miracles all day yesterday. No, we saw one team playing better than another at a particular moment. A miracle is beyond our level to produce it with human understanding or ability. We need something that is so powerful, it can transcend all of what we've done. We need what God can do, not what more of what we can do. That's why it's beautiful when we see, but now the righteousness from God apart from the law has been known to God. God is hungry. God is eager to bring life back into his people, to bring relationship back into his people. One of my favorite stories from Max Lucado, by the way, last week, those of you who were here, it was very interesting. As I started mentioning Max Lucado, there was a couple who came in a few minutes late last Sunday and sat in the back. And after the service, we're going to talk to him just a moment before they left. They go, thank you for saying how much you like Max Lucado. I said, well, I've enjoyed him for years. He goes, he's been our pastor for 25 years. And I'm like, okay, tell Max I, he doesn't know who I am, but that was kind of one of those little personal testimonies there. But he tells this story of a time when his daughters went off to a Christian camp. They were in Texas, and they went off to a Christian camp for 10 days, and they were allowed one phone call home. Max was saying after seven days, when the phone rang, they were hungry to get on the phone, and the daughters were very intelligent. They figured out one daughter could make a call one day, the other one could make her call another day, and they can tag team and get to talk twice. He said, after seven days, they, we knew they were having a great time. They were telling us about the experiences of camp, but they weren't home. And they missed home. And they missed us. And he said, not only did they miss us, we missed them. So much that he left a day early to go to this camp. He got there, he landed the plane early, got a rental car. Did a little bit of sightseeing, had a little bit of food, but he knew he could not go into the camp until 5 p.m. on that particular day. An hour of that, and he was bored to tears. It's time to go to the camp. He's there for his girls. So he comes up to the camp, and there is a road. The camp's out there. Parents are on this side. There is a road across the road that says, no parents admitted until 5 p.m. He got there at 3.30. And he was not alone. And if you've ever had one of those experiences, maybe you've been there too. And parents begin to talk, and they talk about their kids. Where are you from? Okay, that's enough of that. Okay, 4 o'clock, 4.15. He said at 4.30, the mood changed completely. He looked around and noticed that some of the dads had snuck up closer to the rope than he was. So not to be outdone, he went around to the other side where there was a couple of ladies, and he worked his way in between them to get right up front of the rope. He said, I really felt bad for the ladies, but not bad enough to give up my spot in front of them. <laughs> At 10 to 5, silence. No one spoke. No one did anything. They were waiting and looking. At 3 minutes to 5, two brave camp, camp counselors came walking down this dirt road. You can see them in their heads. They're thinking, if we take the rope from this side and fold it over here, people will sneak in this side while we're moving the rope. If we go it this way, they'll come this way. One counselor took this edge. One counselor took this edge, held it tight, and gave a five-second countdown. <laughs> he goes, these people have done this before. On zero, they dropped the rope, and people started to walk at a very brisk pace to get into the camp to find their kids. He was walking very quickly and noticed that one dad actually started jogging. So he said, this is how this works now. 
he broke out into a full-fledged run. <laughs> other dads, other moms began to run down the dirt road for their kids. You know what it's like to be separated from family? How hungry you are just to be with them? Nothing else mattered. We gotta get the kids. This is why chapter 3 Verse 21 of Romans tells us about our Heavenly Father. He dropped the rope, ran full-fledged to us. The righteousness of God, from law, apart from the law, has been made known. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord, to all who believe. The rope is dropped. God runs full force towards each and every one of us because he knows how sin has destroyed our lives in many ways. And his desire is to get us and bring us home. We need a miracle, and God supplies it. The last statement that Max made said, I went from the state of Texas to the state of Missouri. God went from the state of being worshipped eternally in heaven to being born in a manger in Bethlehem. His sacrifice was greater anything we can imagine. Giving himself for our benefit so that we can be a part of the family. What a God. Delivering us from what a mess. We need a God who loves us that much and desires those privileges for us. But we ask the question, okay, God wants us, what does God do with this problem, this rope, the barrier, what the sinfulness that causes death? Does he just shrug his shoulders and go, oh, you know, kids will be kids, not a problem. Why be so angry in the first place today? The righteousness of God, the integrity of God, required punishment for sin. And we know what the wages of sin is, remember? Death. So what did God do to deal justly with the entire world? He took your sinfulness, your sinfulness, your sinfulness, yours, mine as well, took our sinfulness and put it upon Christ himself as he was hanging on the cross. When we hear those words on a good Friday, just words that just rip my heart out, when Jesus cries from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We understand that God had to physically and metaphorically turn his back upon Christ's own son, his own self, because he couldn't be in the presence of sin. But that was what was necessary. That was the full-fledged run into your hearts, your hearts, my life, the life of each one in our world. God did that for us. What a God. Now that's a miracle. That's worth calling it a miracle. You can't do that. We can't manufacture it. And we can't repeat it. Once and for all, God has taken care of that as only God can so that we can be a part of the family. The benefits of being a family are fabulous. As we continue throughout the, first, the next three chapters of the book of Romans, we see the first thing that this brings, that God brings into our heart, is peace with him. Jay, I want to thank you for sending me that email a couple of weeks ago, and I've forgotten that guy's name now. Who is getting ready to pass away, the younger guy, the billionaire, who makes this assertion as he knows he's going to be passing away. He goes, Money won't help me now. It'll be gone. What I think I've accomplished in this world, over. He said, The only thing that matters. That's living at peace with God. That's not having to look over your back shoulder going, have I done enough? Is everything okay? Living in peace with God. That is the miracle that God has brought into our heart. Not only did he bring us that miracle of peace with him, he granted us access to the grace that makes it all possible. We can now receive God's grace. We can appreciate his grace and we can share it with others. 
and he driven, walked, mingled in the past couple of months, you all know we need a little bit more graciousness in our world. And unfortunately, no fortunately, it starts with a little more graciousness in our own hearts. God's grace poured upon us. And I love the acronym for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. He gave all that he had so that we could be all that we are. If you've ever had kids, I wouldn't say if you've ever been a kid, but every one of us here has been a kid at some point. Our parents are very instrumental in our lives. That's one of those special gifts I believe God gives to us. We've made sacrifices for our kids, just as our parents have made sacrifices for us. This past July, you knew this was coming at some point, this past July, our oldest son told us we're going to be grandparents. So February, first grandkid, going to be a granddaughter. We're going to spoil the rod and send them back, let them be spoiled at home. But I had a great conversation with our son, Chase, when we were in Missouri and Branson in July. And I said, the thing I'm most excited about for you is you're going to get to experience what I had with you. This little life in our hands. Loved instantly. Cherished. Continuing to share that throughout the years. And my son and our son's going to get that blessing. in a great way next Saturday. All oh, those years coming up to this. I'm not going to say any more because that's tough. But relish that. That relationship, that gift that God has given to us. Access to grace that the Father has blessed His people with. And then another attribute, the last one I'll talk about this morning. We now have the hope of the glory of God. We have the hope that God has for this world. You might say, I didn't think God ever hoped. He knows. Yes, but there's also that anticipation of fulfillment, which is the definition of hope. Hoping for you, hoping for me, hoping for others who will by faith accept this wonderful gift, be given the gift of life that empowers us to live past the death of sinfulness, that sets us free in the family, we have peace with God. We have grace with God. And we have a hope of God's glory. Not for a little while, but for all eternity. And I have to tell you, the closer I get to eternity, and that's every day now, it's the same truth for each one of us. As we get closer there, it continues to boggle my mind more and more and more. I can't contemplate a thousand years. I can't contemplate 500 years. What's it going to be like for all eternity to be in the presence of God, experiencing the gifts of life, living in that perfect relationship, not feeling the effects of sinfulness? This is God's desire for his people. This is what we're practicing for in this life. And God gives us a lot of practice opportunities. With family, with friends, with others, all of that comes into fruition through the gift of relationships. So we start off in the book of Romans and we realize what a wretched people we are. I want us to feel the full impact of that separation. Because that adds an extra level of joy when we consider the level of reconciliation when God brings us back through the gift of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we can live in the confound statement now of saying, what a God. He loves me. He cares for me. He died for me. And we can share that blessing with others and let life continue to expand. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, for the blessings of life, for your incarnation into this world, 
you leaving the state of being worshipped eternally to dwell among us, that we might know you filled with grace and truth. Lord Jesus, your people worship you this morning. We honor you and thank you for your gift that overcomes all of our wretchedness. Bless each one here with a divine sense of your presence, your acceptance, and your grace. Let us live in that joy and experience the peace that you have for us, the grace that you show, and the hope towards the future. Bless your people. Let us walk in the freedom that you desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers if you all prepare to receive the morning offering. I hope you've had a chance to fill out this sheet that you would drop. I'm seeing hearing there's no pens out there. If you have a pen, do that. If not, we'll get some after the service. But since giving ourselves is an act of worship, let's pray one more once again and say, Lord, thank you for this time. Let your people, let us offer ourselves to you cheerfully and with gladness of heart. And may it all be for your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> gifts and offerings, each individual, each family represented here. We take our gifts, we take our lives, and we present them before you and pray that you would bless them and multiply them for your honor and glory. And for the privilege of offering ourselves and living for you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing for our closing hymn. <clears throat> Number six or five.
this morning. Hope you enjoyed the remainder of this day, the beautiful fall colors. We got the peak of them this weekend, and it is spectacular out there. Enjoy his creation. Remember the one that made it. Live in that glory that he desires for us to live. And thank you for sharing your hearts and lives with us in worship. I pray that God will bless you and keep you. I pray he'll make his face to smile upon you. And I pray that he directs our paths unto his righteousness for his honor and glory. And as we go from here, let us go knowing the peace of Christ upon our hearts that we live in peace with God. Let us know his grace and his hope and live in a way that would be vibrant and pleasing and offering to all. May his Holy Spirit guard your hearts and guide your steps. I pray this blessing upon you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. God's blessings upon you. Thank you again for being with us.